excellencies, distinguished panelists, friends, and colleagues. I would like to welcome all of you joining us from around the world. I'm Jen Beagle, Director General of the International Development Law Organization. And together with our partners, the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University, UN Women, the governments of the Philippines and the Netherlands, I have great pleasure to welcome you to this event on justice for survivors of gender-based violence in complex situations. Violence against women and girls is devastatingly pervasive. Over the course of their lives, approximately one in three women are subject to physical or sexual abuse. And this crisis is only getting worse. During the COVID-19 pandemic, cases of gender-based violence saw a sharp increase. A second shadow pandemic emerged as women faced significant challenges in accessing justice in the face of lockdowns and other restrictions. Gender-based violence is particularly severe in complex contexts, such as conflict, organized crime, and health and climate emergencies. Data indicates that 70% of women in humanitarian or crisis situations experience gender-based violence. And similarly, we have seen the rate of domestic violence increase by up to 300% in the aftermath of certain climate emergencies. For these reasons, IDLO puts combating gender-based violence at the core of its work. We promote survivor-centered approaches to gender-based violence in countries as diverse as Honduras, Myanmar, Mongolia, Somalia, and Tunisia. And we also advocate for the rights of women and girls at the global level. Together with UN Women, UNODC and other partners, we're an active member of the Generation Equality Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence, which aims to increase access to essential services for survivors of GBV and scale up gender responsive policing. And in partnership with the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University, we've conducted research in six countries to better understand the reality of access to justice for GBV survivors in situations of conflict, climate disaster, pervasive organized crime, and health emergencies. The findings have underlined how complex situations exacerbate the challenges that women and girls face in pursuing justice for gender-based violence. These range from systems that place the blame on survivors or maintain immunity for perpetrators to a lack of economic resources. These barriers must be removed. It is worth stating here that sexual and reproductive health and rights are human rights. They are integral to gender equality, women's empowerment, and sustainable development. And yet, legal, policy, and other barriers continue to undermine women's sexual and reproductive rights with severe consequences for their lives, health, and security. We need justice systems that are more effective and responsive to women's needs and laws that protect the full spectrum of women's rights. As the only global intergovernmental organization exclusively devoted to promoting the rule of law to advance peace and sustainable development, IDLO believes that gender equality, including the ability of women and girls to enjoy the full range of their human rights and meaningfully participate in all aspects of society is a key principle of justice and a necessary condition for progress towards the entire 2030 agenda. As expressed in IDLO's strategic plan, justice system can help tackle inequalities by ensuring that everyone is able to enjoy their human rights, including persons in marginalized or vulnerable situations. They're also essential for challenging discriminatory laws, policies, social norms, and stereotypes that hold back women from realizing their development potential. IDLO is committed to ensure that the law and the institutions that help administer it work to protect, empower, and enable women and girls to enjoy their human rights and live their lives with dignity and equality. So it is this inner spirit of urgency that I look forward to our discussion today. We're privileged to have with us an expert panel to explore how we can move closer to eliminating violence against women and girls 
through a survivor-centered justice response. But before turning to our panel, we're delighted to have two distinguished speakers to set the stage for our discussion. Ms. Brigitte Tesla, Deputy Director General for International Cooperation in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. And Ms. Cecile Guterres, Deputy Executive Director for Management Services in the Philippine Commission on Women. And it is now my pleasure to invite Ms. Tesla to take the floor. The floor is yours, Brigitte. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jan. Um, uh, I must ask, though, because um, uh, I'm, apparently um, something needs to happen at your side to, uh, to allow my video on. Um, uh, I, I can continue speaking, obviously. Uh, the demarrer votre vue, okay. Yes, now, now, yes, there we are. Yes, we see you. Good. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jan, uh, for your introductory words. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today on a subject that is uh, dear to my heart. Uh, and um, the, the broad condemnation of sexual violence by the international community makes it really so difficult to digest that sexual violence in conflict is still happening on a wide scale. And there are, of course, many examples where rape uh, as a weapon of war has been witnessed um, in conflict settings, uh, for example, in Ethiopia, Ukraine, uh, Myanmar. And, and then we have all these cases uh, where sexual violence has been ongoing for decades. Uh, think of, uh, of, of Syria, Somalia, DRC. And it is clear that sexual and gender-based violence is a, is a denial of justice, as you mentioned, and it has multifaceted costs. Uh, of course, it, uh, it endangers the, the succeeding on the SDG 5, uh, gender equality. Uh, but we also know that uh, gender-based violence has a link to uh, SDG 3 when it comes to the physical and mental health outcomes. Uh, and at SDG 4, when it comes to girls' education, which is put at risk once there is gender-based violence. And of course, there's also a very clear link with SDG 1 and 8 when it comes to endangering women's rights to work and income uh, security. The study um, uh, that was conducted by uh, IDLO uh, and the Global Women's Institute, and which was financed by the Netherlands, uh, shows clearly that survivors face a multitude of, of challenges in pursuing justice uh, for gender-based violence. And it starts with barriers to reporting and it continues all along the justice chain. Uh, and it's clear that to strengthen access to justice for survivors of gender-based violence in conflict and to contribute to uh, its prevention, we must do more. And we should look at the whole value, uh, the whole uh, justice chain. And in your concept now, do you request speakers to address challenges, approaches, and, and innovation? So let, let me make uh, four points. Uh, first, um, a survivor-centered approach, uh, as is uh, also recommended by the, uh, by the mentioned uh, study, is crucial. It's survivors' voices that are key prerequisites for enhancing access to justice and accountability. And it all seems quite logical, but all too often, we still forget about the survivors' voices. Second, we need to strengthen mechanisms for holding those who perpetrate sexual violence accountable. Impunity perpetuates conflict-related sexual violence. In, for example, South Sudan, the Netherlands is together with the UNDP supporting the establishment, or it has already supported the establishment of the first gender-based violence court. Third, we need to focus on raising awareness. And it, again, that sounds simple and it's but it is so true, it all begins with education. And people, especially women, need to be made aware of their rights. We're doing this uh, legal awareness uh, campaigns also in a number uh, of countries, and we also train uh, female paralegals to provide legal assistance to gender-based violence survivors. And fourth, uh, we need to develop specialized and tailored services uh, as part also of this, what you mentioned, the people-centered justice approach. And we need to gather more data on the specific problems women face on their journey to justice, because only then we can produce real solutions. And again, as an example, Somalia, uh, together in Somalia, together with IDLO, we support alternative dispute resolution centers with referral pathways for gender-based violence uh, survivors. And in Mali, we just set up a gender-based uh, violent unit uh, within the criminal justice uh, chain. 
So as the Netherlands, uh, Jan, we're really very strongly committed to advancing people-centered justice, including justice for survivors of gender-based violence. And we take the lead, um, as you mentioned, also in the Justice Action Coalition, a coalition of countries committed to take uh, action on jointly closing the global justice gap. And the Justice Action Coalition will produce a report in 2023 with uh, updated research and an, estimate si uh, est an estimation of the size of the global justice gap for women, including special attention for gender-based violence survivors. Uh, furthermore, uh, I'm also happy to announce that uh, I, I have to say, finally, we were not the first, but we announced recently announced a feminist uh, foreign policy, uh, and we were we will put gender equality and women's rights at the heart of our international work. And accountability is an imp uh, important aspect of that. And um, as you might know, uh, to this end, we're um, organizing an international conference in the Netherlands on accountability soon. Because it's clear also that when serious investments are, are, are made um, providing survivors access to justice and in holding perpetrators to account, then accountability may function also as a method of uh, prevention. We will remain a strong partner when it comes to this subject and, um, and in preventing and eliminating all sexual violence and conflict. And I look forward to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brigitte, and thanks also to the Netherlands for your great support um, on this subject to uh, many countries at the national level, but also uh, at the global level. Uh, I now turn to uh, Ms. Gutierrez. Uh, the floor is yours. Ms. Gutierrez, are you there? I'm not unmute myself. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, unmuted already, but I can see myself on video. Well, please go ahead and maybe the video will appear. There you are. Okay. I, now, uh, now it's all right. Thank you, Jan. And the uh, excellencies, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be with all of you here today. We extend our gratitude to the International Development Law Organization, the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University and the UN Women for inviting the Philippine government to co-sponsor this side event. Violence against women and gender-based violence are persistent issues felt across the globe affecting one out of three women in their lifetime. It has become increasingly apparent that incidences of violence happen not only in the homes, but also in educational institutions, in the workplace, in public spaces, and also online. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the aftermath of conflicts, climate change induced disasters and environmental degradation, high risk of women and girls experiencing gender-based violence has exacerbated, leaving their feeling of safety eroded and severely affecting all aspects of their lives. In the Philippines, given our longstanding commitment to achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls, including the elimination of violence in all forms, we have established strong legal frameworks to address this complex issue of gender-based violence. This include the special protection of children against child abuse, exploitation and discrimination act of 1992, uh, the anti-sexual harassment act of 1995, the anti-rape law of 1997, Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act in 2003, Anti-Violence Against Women and Their Children Act issued in 2004, the Magna Carta of Women in 2009, the Safe Spa Spaces Act uh, recently in 2019, and the, the amendments to the anti-rape law increasing the age of statutory rape 
and then also the law prohibiting child marriage and amendments to the Anti-Trafficking in Persons Act. The country acknowledges the need for strong cross-sectoral partnership to effectively implement these laws and to respond to emerging issues such as the ongoing pandemic. Interagency councils were established to link the different ministries on social welfare, justice, health, local government, foreign affairs, human rights, civil service, education, labor, women and children, and public security. These mechanisms are responsible for implementing and monitoring relevant laws, developing comprehensive programs for victim survivors, and promoting an in integrated approach to eliminate uh, violence against women and children. In anticipation of increased gender-based violence cases during the pandemic, a call to action by the interagency mechanism was issued to ensure continuous and accessible frontline services and resources, including through alternative means. The Philippine Commission on Women is the oversight agency for gender equality and women's empowerment and national catalyst for gender mainstreaming. In its medium term, Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Plan for 2019 to 2025, a strategic goal area is dedicated to quote, significant reduction in gender-based violence and enhanced gender perspective on justice, security, and peace, unquote. It envisions women's improved access to justice, including transitional justice, empowerment of victim survivors to seek help, better understanding of the root, root cause, impact and social cost of gender-based violence, and women's leadership and meaningful participation in all stages of peace and security processes, especially in the conflict areas. The plan also includes a chapter on, quote, transforming gender norms and culture, unquote, to address the deeply embedded discriminatory values and beliefs that contribute to gender-based violence. Stakeholders from the government, civil society, and the private sector are committed to achieving the targets set out in the plan with overall guidance from the Philippine Commission on Women. The Philippines highly values collaborative act action and advocacy as part of a whole of society approach to address gender-based violence and deliver justice to victim survivors. We welcome opportunities to elevate issues to a global level such as through this side event. We are hopeful that discussions will bring about immediate, responsive, and innovative actions from duty bearers collaborative ideas and initiatives from civil society actors and conscientious effort from communities that are directly affected by the obstacles brought by gender-based violence. May we remember to uphold in high regard the experiences and struggles of gender-based violence victim survivors and let this influence our continued efforts for women's empowerment and gender equality. Thank you very much. And in our language, maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Cecile. And I think you have uh, emphasized very well uh, the importance of, of cross-sectoral partnerships and whole of society approaches. And let me thank um, the government of Philippines and the Netherlands again for co-sponsoring this event. And let me now welcome our panel of experts who will connect the local, the national, the regional and the global perspectives and explore key uh, legal and justice dimensions for addressing gender-based violence. We have Ms. Reem al Salim the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, Its Causes and Consequences, Professor Chelsea Ullman, Research Scientist at the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University, Justice Susan Okalani, Judge in the High Court of Uganda 
and member of the National Association of Women Judges of Uganda. Dr. Fiona Bukula, Gender Specialist at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. Ms. Jacqueline Nasiwa, Executive Director of the Center for Inclusive Governance, Peace and Justice in South Sudan. Mr. Kamsavar Chantavi Souk, Policy Specialist on Ending Violence Against Women at UN Women. And Ms. Melissa Skaya, Director of International Training at Global Rights for Women and a consultant for UN Women. So welcome to all our panelists. At the end of the panel discussion, we'll be pleased to welcome questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please um, submit them in the Q&A function of Zoom and um, some of those questions uh, will be able to be given to the panel at a later stage. So I'm going to begin with uh, Reem al Saleem, uh, UN Special Rapporteur, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to ask you, as the lead UN expert on violence against women, its causes and consequences, what do you see as some of the major challenges women and girls face when seeking justice for gender-based violence, particularly in difficult and complex situations? And we're aware that your upcoming report to be presented to the General Assembly in September focuses on violence against women and girls in the context of the climate crisis. What justice challenges do GBV survivors encounter in such situations? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to IDLO and the other co-organizers for convening this event uh, and for the kind invitation. I'm unable, okay, now I can start my video. Yes. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I apologize in advance that I'm participating in less than ideal circumstances, as I'm in a small airport in a border area between two Middle Eastern countries, so, so my apologies if there's a lot of noise. Uh, as we've heard, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development foresees the ending of all forms of discrimination, violence, and harmful practices against women and girls as part of its goal number five, which, uh, as uh, Brigitte mentioned very eloquently, demonstrates that achieving gender equality is not only a human rights issue, but also an element that is really essential for the prosperity of nations and their development, which means also that by definition, gender equality, as well as the prevention and response to uh, gender-based violence is necessary for achieving all of the other targets concern, uh, contained within the development uh, goals. Now we have known this in the past and we know this better today because obviously of the avalanche of complex situations that we've uh, found ourselves globally in over the last uh, three years, whether it has to do with COVID and increasing the risk faced by women in experiencing violence or actually the experience of violence, or also the increasing awareness that we have uh, gained collectively of the damning implications of the climate crisis on the enjoyment of human rights and uh, specifically on the rights of women and girls to live a life that is free from violence. Uh, now we are dealing with a multi-layered, multi-faceted crisis in which climate change combined with COVID have also exacerbated conflict and increased the multiple crises of human rights, including this epidemic of violence against women. And uh, the intersectional discrimination women have already suffered from has made them more vulnerable to the negative consequences of these forces, but has also made their experience of discrimination more pronounced. Uh, though, uh, Jan, I cannot go into uh, too much detail about my upcoming report that I will present to the General Assembly. Uh, the report, along with the one I recently presented to the Human Rights Council, notes that women, uh, uh, particularly those coming from specific backgrounds or that have specific identities uh, are more vulnerable to experiencing forms of uh, violence. And if I can give uh, uh, specific examples about the nexus between climate change, um, conflict and uh, violence against women, uh, we know, for example, that domestic violence, which is one of the common forms of violence that women and girls experience across the globe, may become more pronounced in country uh, and which is more pronounced in countries where there is impunity. Uh, you, you put on top of that the climate crisis and you have indications that uh, this phenomenon of domestic violence uh, is likely to increase. Uh, women find it more difficult to perform gender ascribed domestic roles in some countries. Uh, 
the gender division of labor can become more pronounced, which then renders them more vulnerable to recrimination, punishment, and violence at the hands of their spouses, who may feel more emasculated because they also cannot perform their gendered roles as breadwinners or providers. Then any hope for support that these women may be able to get, which might already be little, become further diminished uh, because they are more impoverished, because probably in the area where they are, there is more of a breakdown of the law, because social relations also might break down, because then the referral mechanisms and response mechanisms uh, may also break down, and therefore uh, they find themselves increasingly in a, in a more difficult uh, situation, not to mention that then women specific issues like sexual and reproductive rights, perhaps education for their girls, all these get sidelined uh, and deprioritized. I should also say that when it comes to the specific question of the challenges of justice, we need to also ask ourselves uh, justice for whom and what does that justice look like, especially when a woman has to choose between sheer survival, uh, fundamental safety and access to justice. And an honest answer to these questions will not be possible if we don't take uh, into consideration a victim-centered approach, as you mentioned, and if, if we do not ensure that women and women-led organizations participate fully in all aspects of any process that affect women's lives, including to prevent justice, and uh, that is designed to protect and assist them. Um, and um, access to justice cannot be addressed as an isolated piece of the puzzle. Uh, and we need to continue to work on the underlying causes of violence that need to be addressed comprehensively together and uh, as part of an all society approach as, as we heard. So a good legal framework that has no teeth, uh, that has no resources to be implemented, that is not accompanied by uh, 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 incentives and initiatives to change social norms, as we heard. Uh, also, that is not supported by meaningful livelihood or opportunities for women and victims. Uh, then will will really uh, it will uh, take us nowhere. Uh, so, amongst the plethora of challenges uh, that we may face uh, additionally in the complex. Uh, uh, situations, I want to very quickly highlight four challenges that I think will make the access to justice in complex situations more difficult. One is the further fragmentation breakdown of the first line of assistance, safety nets and protection that victims of violence should have access to precisely because of the combination of environmental, operational and security related factors um, that will make the setup and proper functioning of these services uh, more difficult and let's face it some of them will become more difficult uh, because also resources will increasingly get diverted to other priorities that states and non-state actors find more compelling that might be uh, of economic or military nature so therefore the uh, resources for these avenues will become even uh, less uh, available. The second challenge is gender stereotyping and the extent uh, of the influence of that uh, on the delivery of justice. Some of these prejudices that are based on the inferiority of a sex or gender are already an outcome of prevailing social and cultural norms, but uh, they continue to be proliferated by the media. They, uh, they also are very ingrained in the work of judicial systems, law enforcement, uh, and therefore they, they, they result in increasing barriers for uh, women, particularly groups of women. If we talk about, for example, women of diverse uh, gender identities, sexual orientations, or uh, indigenous women. So, so all these gender stereotypes uh, will become even uh, uh, more pronounced and have a more pronounced impact when it comes to the access uh, of judge, uh, justice. Also, I would like to say that the increasing role of non-state actors as perpetrators and accelerators of violence uh, will also uh, play an increasing role and uh, their continued lack of accountability. We know, of course, that individuals in a family uh, are non-state actors that can be uh, non-accountable and there's high impunity for their actors. But I'm also thinking increasingly about companies and other non-state actors and the legal loopholes and challenges uh, uh, when it comes to their activities. So uh, we know, for example, that companies that work in certain areas like extractive businesses, 
um, uh, they, they result in increased violence uh, for, for women in the areas where they operate. Uh, and the question is also the responsibility of states that are affiliated with these companies, uh, either by aiding, abetting, or collectively uh, contributing and supporting uh, these actions. And fourth and last, I would like to say that uh, it's going to become more challenging to work in a localized manner, in a long-term manner, with and through victims, uh, including on prevention issues, um, in part because of the diversion of the resources, uh, it's going to be harder to support really uh, um, um, uh, grassroots organization, uh, civil society, and women-led organization at the front, forefront of these issues. Uh, and we really need to find ways to continue to show solidarity with them, provide them with political support, financial support, because their work is really fundamental in order to be able to uh, achieve justice in a, in a way that really speaks to the needs of the victims and, and that speaks to the needs also of the societies where they are. Uh, so I will leave it at that and thank you very much uh, for the time. Thank you very much, Reem, and thank you for joining us from an airport. It's really wonderful. I think you have set out the complexity, you know, the, as you said, the multi-layered nature um, of, of this problem and, and of also, obviously, of the solution. So I'm pleased to turn to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Uh, Chelsea Ullman, a professor from George Washington uh, University. So, uh, Professor Ullman, together with IDLO, you've worked on a new research report, Survivor Centered Justice for Gender-Based Violence in Complex situation. So as a scholar in this field, I'd like to ask you, um, is the aspiration um, for a future without violence against women grounded in available evidence? I mean, in other words, can we end violence against women and girls? And what are some of the interventions that work to improve access to justice for survivors? Over to you, Dr. Uman. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. I appreciate you having me, particularly as I'm standing in last minute for my colleague, Mary Ellsberg, who's unfortunately sick with COVID. Um, but I'll start by saying it's a wonderful question. And one of the great achievements of researchers and practitioners and activists working on violence against women and girls over the past few decades is the finding that violence against women and girls is actually preventable. It's not an inevitability, we can change it. And while we've often said and thought that this kind of social change could take generations, research evaluating the impact of certain kinds of interventions is showing us that actually you can reduce violence in a relatively short programmatic time frame. So programs like SASA, which many of you may have heard of, a community mobilization program focused on preventing violence against women and girls, it was developed in Uganda, but has now been adapted to many different contexts. An evaluation of SASA demonstrated a 52% reduction in physical intimate partner violence in about a three-year programmatic time frame. So we know that prevention is possible. And at the Global Women's Institute, where I am and, and my colleague Mary Ellsberg is, much of our research has focused on women and girls' experiences of violence in different settings and what works to prevent that violence. So this includes research in the most challenging settings, including fragile and conflict affected settings. And a few years ago, we led a study with the IRC in South Sudan that was the very first prevalent study on violence against women and girls in that country in South Sudan. And at the time we began the study, it was a post-conflict context. And then conflict broke out during the study and it became a, a conflict context, an acute conflict. And we've tried as an institute to really build up our capacity and share that capacity with other researchers to conduct research on violence against women and girls in very complex contexts, including in conflict settings. And we've been involved in other research since then in fragile and conflict affected settings and with some of the most marginalized populations. So our Women our Empowered Aid Project, for example, explores sexual exploitation and abuse of refugee women and girls by humanitarian aid workers in two refugee settings, Lebanon and Uganda. And we view this kind of research in these, in these fragile settings as crucial in better understanding the experiences of violence of different women and girls so we can learn how to better prevent and respond to that violence. So that brings me to the project that we were very honored to work on with the IDLO, which was the six country study on access to justice for survivors in, in different complex contexts. 
And these six settings, which were Afghanistan, Honduras, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, South Sudan, and Tunisia, were all complex in different ways. So some like Afghanistan and South Sudan had been affected by conflict. One was grappling in an acute way with the harmful impacts of climate change, Philippines. And then looking at the presence of organized crime in Honduras and what that means both for femicide in the country and access to justice for survivors of violence. And in these conversations with key stakeholders in these settings, several key findings emerged that help us better understand how to strengthen access to justice for survivors, not just in these complex settings, but also survivors in all settings. And I'll just highlight a few of those here. Um, first, I just want to emphasize, as has been mentioned by my colleagues on this panel, first, how um, important it is to keep survivors at the center of all justice responses and justice systems. So as justice processes are developed, especially in complex situations, thinking first about how survivors will experience those processes and what they need from them. Second, how important monitoring is for accountability. It's very important. Some of these special justice mechanisms that we were looking at in this six country study, for example, the special court for survivors of conflict related sexual violence in South Sudan, that's come out of the peace agreement. These commitments need to be monitored to ensure that survivors are, are accessing them and they're serving survivors needs. Also increasing faith in justice institutions, reducing corruption and enhancing accountability, as I mentioned, reducing that feeling of impunity that can permeate justice institutions and whole societies, particularly when there's been a complexity like a conflict. The importance of services for survivors, as has been mentioned, things like legal aid, psychosocial counseling, shelters, one-stop centers, Often it's women's rights organizations doing this work to establish services and a referral pathway, ensuring survivors get the support they need. So it's about making sure those services are um, good and there, but also supporting women's rights organizations who are the experts in their context to lead this work and to do it effectively. And finally, I'll just leave you by emphasizing the connection between primary prevention and justice. They're not two wholly separate things. They're very much connected. So how does strengthening access to justice for survivors help us change norms and prevent violence? How is primary prevention important to access to justice for survivors? So to continuing to figure out together what works to prevent violence in different settings and adapting those interventions to reduce violence and improve the lives of women and girls. So I'll leave it there, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ullman, and, and thank you and your colleagues for your work on this. I think uh, you give us some hope um, and certainly some, some very practical points, which I think we're, we're all uh, very keen to hear. I'm now very pleased to give the floor to Justice uh, Susan Akalnani. Um, your perspective, Justice, as a member of the judiciary at the national level is really important for our discussion today. And I'd like to ask you, what are the main challenges for a national justice system to address violence against women and girls, particularly in conflict and post-conflict situations? You have the floor. Thank you very much, Jan, Your Excellencies, fellow panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen. I'll first start by saying that I'll be talking about one uh, conflict and post-conflict related uh, situation, that is the Lord's Resistance Army conflict in the North, for which uh, category of, of cases this court, the International Criminal Division of the High Court was established, um, and also the promulgation of the Rome Statute Act in Uganda, uh, which put Uganda at, um, as a frontliner in the fight against uh, conflict-related uh, sexual gender-based violence amongst other crimes. So we do have a very robust legal system and framework um, as far as combating SGBC crimes, as SGBV crimes is concerned. We also have very good policies in place um, established by the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development those policies, the gender-friendly policies. We have a gender policy. We have policies for implementation of uh, the Security Council resolutions um, and the GOMA declaration, as Uganda is a member of the International Conference of the Great Lakes Region. So we are not lacking as far as legislation and policies are concerned, except for a, a few laws that I'll point out uh, shortly. Um, but that notwithstanding, 
we only have um, two cases that have been uh, prosecuted uh, as far as post uh, uh, conflict and post conflict situations are concerned. That is the case of Dominic Ongwen that was handled in the ICC and the current case of Thomas Coelho, which is being tried here at the International Crimes Division. Um, and what, it, what, what is responsible for um, the dismal per performance as far as uh, conflict related uh, gender based violence is concerned are a number of reasons. But I want to say that nationally, SGBV, in my view, has reached pandemic proportions already. So where you have a, a response, a systemic response, which is not up to um, the standard uh, in peacetime, you wouldn't expect miracles in, uh, uh, in conflict or in emergency situations. Uh, so what is responsible for the poor performance, if, if you may say, or call it that, are a lot of challenges. But I want to say one of the challenges um, that the judiciary and the police and the DPP uh, is, are faced with, one of them is numbers, sheer numbers. The number of judicial officers vis-a-vis -vis the magnitude of case load, the number of police officers and uh, prosecutors vis-a-vis -vis the number of cases. And it should also be take noted that um, very few cases, about two in, in four of gender-based violence are reported. So while we are clogged with too many cases, this is just less than 2% of the actual um, occurrence of the crimes. Now, when you have so many um, cases to handle and the numbers are few, that is what will happen. So you end up with um, poorly investigated cases. And that is why there's a high rate of dismissal of cases in courts because they are not well investigated. And the finger, finger pointing between the, the judiciary uh, and the police, the police saying that the, the, the courts are using very high standards, archaic uh, evidential rules to throw out cases. But having been a prosecutor uh, before, I, I can say without uh, risk of contradiction that the standard of investigation of cases is very low. Of the few cases that are reported, which cases are clogging the system because we don't have the capacity, the human resource capacity to conclude these cases it is a problem. We also have um, a list of, of problems. I just want to read through them, if I may. There's a lack of victims' awareness of their rights, and maybe that's why they don't report. When they report these crimes, they also withdraw them. They withdraw them at the level of the police. Um, and those withdrawals are also gendered in a way because of traditional systems or mechanisms of um, handling conflicts, which contradict the formal system. There is a lot of stigma towards victims. There's victims lack of awareness of actual uh, legal processes. There's also delay, of course, when the investigations are poorly conducted, there's also delay in conducting investigations and that causes also backlogs. Forensic evidence is poorly collected, poor resourcing of the criminal uh, investigations directory, conflict between formal and informal systems, I've mentioned that, poor facilitation of specialized units. We do have specialized units. The police and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions have specialized units. Uh, now, because of that poor facilitation of those units, their performance cannot be up to date in the courts as far as prosecution of, of, of presenting, presentation of cases is concerned. And there's also a problem of health. There are several uh, documents that I have seen and policies signed by the Minister of Health together with the Minister of Gender, uh, which would encourage coordination and collaboration 
between uh, the, the, those two ministries as far as um, providing services for victims of uh, gender-based violence. But the reality is that medical officers who find themselves um, um, troubled with so many cases that they are dealing with, medical cases and emergencies, do not feel uh, obl obliged to investigate SGBV cases that uh, are, are taken to them. When they prepare these reports, they do, the, they do so in a hurry. And some of the reports are thrown out because they, are, they, are not, uh, they don't meet the evidentiary standards. For instance, a report might even say that there was no sexual act. And that is a legal, a legal question. But because of poor training or lack of skills and knowledge, the medical personnel um, in some cases, and in many of them, decide to make an opinion. And, and that is a legal opinion that they have made, not a medical opinion. That leads to throwing out of those uh, uh, papers, reports. There's also the problem of corruption within the judicial uh, system. And that is starting from the, the local councils, the police, the, the, the judiciary, uh, and so on. Many unofficial fees are charged. For instance, victims are required to pay certain monies for medical examinations. And that discourages many of them from reporting. Limited psychosocial services that provide quality services to victims. It's not possible for victims in many cases in rural areas to receive psychosocial support. There's also a poor referral chain system between public authorities and uh, GBV survivors. I could go on and on and on uh, listing the challenges, but the, the result of all those challenges is that the cases that are brought before courts most of the time are not properly investigated and lead to the dismissal rates that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justice Okami. I understand that the challenges are, are huge. I'm just trying to uh, make certain that everyone will have a chance um, to, to give their perspective and hopefully we will have time for um, some uh, questions um, from, from the floor as well. But thank you so much for that very, uh, that very real uh, intervention and all the challenges that, that you have been facing. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Fiona Kula. Uh, Dr. Kula brings a perspective from the Pacific in her role as gender specialist at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. So from, from a very different region and let's see if, hear if the challenges are, are similar. So I wonder Dr. Kula, if you can give us some examples of regional approaches that you see in your region are, are working to improve access to justice for survivors of gender-based violence. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you and um, good night from PG. Um, so I think some of the panelists have all, um, talked about the challenges of accessing justice in um, in in um, in in challenging environments and circumstances, and very much some of that is um, um, relevant to to our region here in the Pacific. Um, uh, climate change is um, our biggest challenge at the moment, and um, having also now been going through the pandemic, there are. Um, challenges to accessing justice for for women and girls, especially around the remoteness of our islands. Um, we are a vast uh, ocean um, of a country and so countries. So the the vastness of the ocean, the remoteness and also the terrain um, poses different challenges for access to justice um, for women and girls. And of course, um, we also have challenges around um, cultural and customary norms, which um, also have, um, as some of the other panelists have spoken to. 
But I think in terms of regional work and regional partnerships, I'd like to speak a bit about the work of the Partnership on Ending Violence Against Women and Girls, which is a uh, funded through the European Union and supported by the governments of Australia and New Zealand. And it enables the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, the Pacific Community and UN Women Pacific to work jointly, jointly under a common framework to address um, ending violence against women and girls and also gender equality more broadly, because we know that that's in, interconnected. Um, each of the partners in this, um, in this program is responsible for um, three different outcomes. So the Pacific community looks at enhancing Pacific's youth's formal um, in-school and informal education on gender equality and preventing violence against women and girls. Um, uh, the UN uh, Pacific looks at promoting gender equality, equitable social norms at individual and community levels to prevent violence against women and girls. And the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, where I work, works to uh, support national and regional, regional CSOs to advocate, monitor, and report on regional and government commitments to enhancing gender equality um, and uh, ending violence against women and girls. And I think this is really important because like in many other regions, um, civil society has really who has really led the, the advocacy and the action around um, the grassroots activism on in, uh, addressing violence against women and girls. And a, and a program like this brings together not only an international organization like the United Nations, but regional organizations, the political, um, uh, or uh, organization of the region, the Pacific Island Forum Secretary, plus technical organizations. And it enables um, local knowledge to be able to, um, it, it enables regional organizations to work with our forum member countries, but also CSOs, and to build on the work that's already been done and to also strengthen the, the um, work that is has been going on because we've had a lot of progress in addressing ending violence against women and girls but um, we also recognize in our in, in our region that there's still a lot of work to do and the Pacific Leaders Gender Equality Declaration of 2012 um, outlines ending violence against women and girls as one of its six um, focus areas, thematic areas. And so a collaboration like the Pacific Partnership on Ending Violence Against Women and Girls allows a multi-stakeholder approach to addressing a problem which we in our region recognize as, a, as one of our biggest uh, social uh, problems. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hukura. I think you have again emphasized the importance of partnerships and multi-stakeholder uh, approaches. I'm now giving the floor to Ms. Jacqueline uh, Nasiwa. And uh, Ms. Nasiwa, you're not only uh, the founder of a woman-led organization, the Center for Inclusive Governance, Peace and Justice, but you have also been involved firsthand in influencing your country's peace process of bringing the voices of South Sudanese women uh, to the negotiating table. So I wonder if you could um, tell us from your work, um, what do you see um, as approaches um, that work in improving access to justice for survivors of gender-based violence in conflict and post-conflict situations and how can they contribute uh, to sustainable peace? Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ian, for moderating this session. I'm so uh, happy and humbled to be in this uh, uh, panel. Um, what I would say is that I'm going to be bringing uh, voices of survivors. Um, at the Center for Inclusive Governance, we have a, a state level survivor network. And recently we just formed a national survivor network. And uh, I'm glad to hear that monitoring of uh, trial processes or access to justice processes for survivors is very important. And uh, recently I'll also be sharing some examples of our monitoring uh, tool that we use for the mobile courts. Uh, one thing I will say is that for sustainable peace for survivors, uh, it's what they think is peace for them. And I think for a survivor, justice is peace. And this came across all the survivors that I interacted with. 
and they say without justice, there is no uh, peace. And they also say that uh, they need to be supported, like for them to be able to access the justice system, there is high need for support uh, in terms of uh, collecting the evidence, in terms of uh, uh, accessing these courts, in terms of accessing the hospitals. Uh, one thing we found in the recent court monitoring in Ye, which has just concluded on the 27th of this month, most of the cases were either delayed or thrown out as it's shared with the uh, Ugandan experience because of lack of evidence. And some of the survivors didn't know even they need to get a police. And also the hospitals were not accessible to most of the survivors who stay at the grassroots level. So by the time they come to the court, those evidence are lost or they were not collected. And these cases are thrown out. Survivors lack transport to the hospitals. And that means that if you need a, the, the real victim from the grassroots to come to the hospital to report, they need to be transported. And in a conflict setting like South Sudan, it's even difficult that people can have transport to access those villages because of insecurity and also because they cannot be able to walk that long distance to report these cases. And the other uh, problem survivors face is uh, lack of legal representation. And this calls for legal representation for survivors. In the recent case, uh, my organization, we monitor about 17 trial cases in the mobile court, and none of these ones have legal representation. The perpetrators, who are men in uniform, they had lawyers to represent them, but the victims, none of them had lawyer. And the judgments that came from there, most of the cases were thrown out. Only uh, uh, four were able to be tried, but the charges were not based on the law because our law said 14 years imprisonment. And I was struck when a case of uh, gang rape was only charged for two years. And then the fine was given, but no compensation was given. The fine remained on paper because these victims cannot follow up. And some of the victims asked that they want to appeal the cases, but because it's a mobile court, it was closed and these victims cannot appeal. So issues of just compensation becomes a problem. And in most cases, when they even award the compensation, they ask the perpetrators to pay. And these perpetrators are soldiers who depend on government salary and their salaries cannot even compensate these victims. So victims go without compensation and for sustainable peace and for victims to feel at, at peace, they require just compensation, not just compensation on the paper, which cannot be awarded to them. Uh, issues of stigma are high. In the trial process, victims are exposed to the perpetrators and they are exposed also to the public. And the victims here come paraded and the perpetrators are paraded and they have to identify. And in the process, you find that they are exposed or they are stigmatized and there is no proper protection mechanism for them. So exposing them without protection is giving them more re-victimization because these perpetrators can be get back to the communities and go and attack these uh, victims again. It also re-traumatizes them reminding them about the experience because you are standing here with men in uniform and you are, you are, you are being cross-examined when they are looking at you. So this kind of trial process, I could say it's more of a kangaroo uh, kind of a trial instead of supporting the victims to get access to justice. Um, the other challenge is that as uh, in our sister country, Uganda, there are many laws. South Sudan signed most of those laws that Uganda signed because we are part of the East African community but implementation of those laws is zero. The courts are not even consistent in the application of those laws. And that leaves the victim who doesn't know even about their rights to know if the, the, the trial is fair for them or if they have been given the just their protection in the courts or even if the compensation is uh, good for them. The other challenge victims face is that they lack proper shelter. When this incident happened in the panic there in the community, and they run for their lives, especially when there's ongoing conflict, the first thing they think is their safety rather than uh, reporting these cases to the police. And that means that there is no safety for them. And they are exposed, there's no protection mechanisms that is given to the victims. Um, network of survivors need to be strengthened. This is very important because we have tested it. It helps them to have that collective sense of resilience 
where they can be able to share their experiences and also advocate and counsel themselves through their uh, sharing of experiences. Um, the, the networks also help them to do joint advocacy on common issues that affect them. But lit Hello, you seem to have frozen. We seem to have lost Ms. Nasiwa for the minute. Um, ask IT to try to um, bring her back. But meanwhile, I'm going to go on to our, our next speaker, who's Mr. Uh, Chandra V. Suk uh, from UN Women. And um, can you tell us what is the approach taken by UN Women uh, to the elimination of, of uh, GBV, which is one aspect of a, of a broader I think more comprehensive uh, approach and how do you seem to survive this in your programming work? Over to you. Thank you, Ms. Chan Biko for, for, for the question and thank you for having me. Um, UN Women works on ending violence against women and girls is guided by international human, human rights normative frameworks and is grounded on seven core principles, respect, non-discrimination, safety, confidentiality, informed consent, support and prevention. So for us, it's very important to build a common understanding of what these principles means in practice and how to apply them meaningfully in programming policy and ad advocacy efforts at the national, global, regional and global levels. Um, UN Women has been leading uh, the work to support different sectors, not just the justice sector to ensure a survivor center approach in the work on data collections and analysis, essential services, safe cities and safe public spaces, prevention, elimination of harmful practices, movement buildings, and legislative reforms. The survivor, the survivor center approach also informed the UN system-wide mechanism to preventing and responding to all forms of violence against women, in, including sexual harassment, across the humanitarian development, peace, security, and climate change nexus. A survivor center approach is foremost recognizes survivors as agent of change in shaping not only the response to the violence that they have experienced, but also working with partners to ensure that initiatives seeking to eliminate violence are informed by their voices in all of their diversities. So for our work, um, I really appreciate uh, the colleague from GW, I, uh, George uh, Washington University about the, the, the importance between linking primary preventions and response together because they go hand in hand. So with regard to our preventing work, um, it's guided by the respect framework for, viol for violence against women prevention programming based on evidence, based on what we have learned of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the, the work is led by UN Women and WHO, uh, which emphasizes that good quality services for survivors with are delivered in ways that respect women's and their rights can reduce risk factors for violence. And that services can also assist the early identification of violence and reduce its reoccurrence. So under our work on safe cities and safe space programming, uh, for example, in, Equ in, Q in Quito, Ecuador, the Metropolitan Passengers Transport Company has trained more than 600 staff to assist survivors of harassment and other forms of sexual violence, particularly in public space, through applying protocol that uphold consistent standard of response. So in this case, care services were introduced in five of the main uh, Metropolitan Transport uh, Transportation Stations. Um, which lead to the increase of reporting of sexual harassment in a timely manner and the, the support to, to survivors in a tam, timely manner as well. And essentially under our essential services program, in the justice sector, UN Women in partnership with uh, UNODC, UNODC, the Office of Drug and Crime, and the International Association of Women's Police, and of course with the support uh, from partners such as IDL Law, develop and launch a handbook on gender responsive police services for women and girls subject to violence last year. 
which we are now using in our work in, with police on strengthening investigation of violence against women and sp supporting uh, institutional change. It has, it has been carried out in more than 12 countries across five regions. Lastly, many civil society organizations providing services to survivors view violence against women uh, prevention and response as uh, closely linked and we mutually reinforcing. UN Women has been working closely with women rights organizations and feminist informed organizations who have been leading this work to ensure that women's uh, and girls' voices inform prevention and response. Um, and inform the way we design a program, policy, and advocacy across different socio-political, economic contexts and setting. Um, I just would like to share my my input there, and thank you for 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 the for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, our last panelist is uh, Ms. Melissa Skaya, who uh, you've worked for many years, uh, Melissa, to address domestic violence in the United States as well as internationally. Uh, and we know that um, you have led the domestic abuse intervention programs in Minnesota that are known as the Duluth model, and that you have helped to develop survivor-centered guidance for programs aiming to eliminate uh, gender-based violence. So could you give us uh, your recommendations for including survivors in justice programming? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm joining you from uh, on holiday I'm, uh, in Scotland, and I'm located above a pub. So hopefully it won't get too rowdy in the pub uh, during my short time with you here today. Uh, thank you, though, for this invite here today. So uh, as you mentioned, I come from Minnesota from uh, the Duluth model. Many of you may recognize what is known when we talk about domestic violence specifically as the power and control wheel, which has now been uh, translated into 31 different languages around the world to look at uh, the voices of survivors in domestic violence relationships uh, in particular. I come from an organization called Global Rights for Women. And what we've done is we've worked with UN women to develop a guide for safely consulting with survivors. And so listening to all the speakers um, has been really helpful and interesting. We've partnered with IDLO at Global Rights for Women on a number of initiatives. And in particular sort of We've asked communities and countries with the essential services package um, and with other sorts of guides about when they've been implementing them about why they haven't sort of engaged with survivors, either in a focus group or in interviews. And we generally heard two main reasons. One, the first main reason we heard is that they believe it would be re-traumatizing to survivors. So that's one reason why we've heard that people haven't done it. And the second is, I recently talked to a man from a, a, a country and he just said, I don't even know how, what steps I should take to do that. And so that's what we've uh, tried to do with the development of this guide is to say to countries and communities is to lay out all the steps of how to do it in a way that's safe and ethical, and also how to think about all the considerations you have to make when you're engaging with survivors. What we generally sort of, um, two ways we think about this is one is either to do focus group discussions with survivors or individual interviews. So a main sort of component of what many know as the Duluth model is, is we'd say, you're, you're not engaging in that sort of work or survivor-centered approach and unless you're engaging with survivors in some sort of way. So all of us here on this panel, for example, are all really smart. We're all really dedicated. Um, but what we miss is understanding what it's like to be a survivor in a particular community that we're working in under particular cultural circumstances in particular levels of intersecting oppressions. So it's our responsibility to really figure out a way to engage with survivors, to learn and understand about what's their experience. So just taking, for example, um, this topic of justice is, we would engage a group of survivors and say, well, what does justice mean to you? Our definition for all of us on this panel is probably very different than what it means to survivors in any number of parts of the world. 
So we would say that we have to really work to engage with survivors in a way to find out what it means with the, for them. We've thought about some of the elements of the essential services package, for example, and try to take those and think, how is it that we would engage with survivors about a number of the topics that are in there? So for example, in a lot of communities, if we want to uh, better understand why survivors maybe haven't reported their violence, you know, to the police, why they're not engaging, and you want to really work to increase access to justice. Well, of course, that means you have to have survivors who are willing to talk to the police, and many aren't. So it's an example of something that we would say is to work with local women's organizations, and we would always say to partner with local women's organizations, and when possible, and we would say pretty strongly pay some money to the women's organizations for their efforts and then um, to survivors for their input to find out why isn't it that survivors aren't engaging um, for example in the the justice system we all have our own notions and ideas about that but we won't know what's really true with survivors until we find out from them so we want to do this um, in a way that's safe um, and ethical and really thought through all the steps. We've also included a section about how to do it over video conference to think about how to do it if you can't do it in person, but you want to be able to reach survivors. We recently worked with a women's organization and part of actually one of the spotlight organizations in Haiti and worked with them to remotely connect with survivors in Haiti. In Haiti. And there are additional safety precautions you have to take in order to do that. I know that the WHO has also written about some of those considerations that we've thought about um, and given input about that as well. But we really want to be thinking about how is it that we engage with survivors. And so anytime an initiative comes up and we're sitting around a virtual table now in this world or in a physical table where we're sitting around with a lot of people, we want to be thinking about what have we done to not just take our thinking here, but to take the thinking of survivors who live in the community we're talking about and, in, and literally including their voices, not figuratively by just what we think, but by actually doing it. And so that's how we uh, hope to do that by the development of this guide is to provide sort of a step-by-step -step process for communities who are nervous about doing that. We hope we're going to fill that gap so you can directly engage with survivors and do it do it so in a meaningful way. Thank you so much, Melissa. I think that was, a, was extremely interesting uh, and very practical. Uh, I'm now going to, in the, in the short time we have available, just um, put um, a couple of the questions that we've got from uh, the audience. In fact, some of them are, are quite similar. So basically I'm taking um, two that are representative of um, the type of questions that have been that have been asked, and I'm going to ask uh, put the two of them. Then I'm going to ask each of the of the panel members just to give us really a couple of minutes maximum each. Um, they can answer any or, or of the question that that they wish. So the first one is actually from Lydia Umar, who's a judicial affairs officer in UNSOM, so the United Nations mission in Somalia, and she asks. How important are female investigators and women's representation in police, military, and justice sectors in preventing GBV and ensuring justice for women? And then another question is from Zainab Malik from Hill Organization in the Netherlands. And, and she asks, um, you know, eliminating gender-based violence has been at the top of the global agenda in many ways. It's highlighted in the 2030 agenda and in the Secretary General's new report, Our Common Agenda, but there often seems to be a disconnect between, um, you know, the recognition as a global challenge and the resources allocated to address it, um, and particularly to ensure justice for survivors. And she asked, how could we um, call for better financing? Um, for justice for survivors. So those are those are two uh, two questions. I'm I'm going to start um, just really if we could just give like one to two minute very quick answers um, with Reem if you're still on the line. Not sure. I think she may have had to leave. So let me go to Dr. Ullman. 
Hi, I'll just say quickly on the first point about the importance of female representation as justice actors throughout the system. I think it's really important. I mean, my I think probably some of the other panelists can speak better to that. Um, my work is primarily from the research perspective, but we know that having researchers that represent the community they're researching in is really important. So um, that idea about um, survivors being able to share their experiences, whether they're going through a justice process or they're participating in research with somebody who, who looks and feels like them is an important piece of the puzzle. But the last thing I'll just say about it overarchingly is that in our research with IDLO, um, training of justice actors at all levels is really important. Sensitization about violence specifically, that's really a crucial part of having this survivor-centered approach that I think we're all very committed to in, in justice processes. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Uh, justice Okalani. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, concerning female investigators, female judges, female prosecutors, this is very important because it works. From my uh, experience as a judicial officer and as a prosecutor, I was told recently by male colleagues that accused persons uh, fear to plead guilty uh, in STBG cases before female judicial officers because they do suffer penalty. We do have a wide sentencing uh, range, but the female judicial officers tend to use higher sentences. So I think it was children feel comfortable, child victims, female victims of gender-based violence feel more comfortable working with fellow women. As far as resource allocation is concerned, uh, I, in my view, it is a question of political will. You know, you put your money where your mouth is. And uh, we also should think about avoiding this list. There are so many donor funded or government funded programs uh, implemented by different actors. If we could sit together and uh, as an um, intersectoral mechanism, a lot of resources will be pulled together and used for victim justice. Not, not for implementing case laws, clear number of cases uh, uh, completed, but this justice will translate to real victims getting redress. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Uh, Dr. Bukula. Thank you. I think I'll just speak to the question around um, involving women in uh, the response. So I think, yes, um, I agree with uh, Chelsea. Um, as a former researcher myself, I think it's really important to engage women in, um, in, the, in, in research around this um, area of ending violence against women and girls. And I also think uh, it, it is important to have women um, as first responders in that law and justice sector. And in, in the Pacific region where we also have uh, the informal um, justice mechanisms, it, it's important to have the role, uh, to have women uh, in those roles, for example, in Papua New Guinea, where there's village courts, um, having women as magistrates, but not only magistrates, but peace officers and clerks. I think that um, provides a kind of visibility and um, may help women um, be more confident about um, accessing justice. So whether it's at the community level or um, in the more formal sector uh, with policing or um, uh, in the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Nasiwa. Okay, thank you very much. I'll respond in regards to also having a female representative in the justice system. Um, I think when we have more female probably in the courts, uh, women get the confidence, uh, survivors get the confidence of speaking or accessing the courts. Uh, one example is that in the recent mobile courts in South Sudan, uh, five of the justices were all men. And I was not surprised that their judgments are coming out in the way they are not uh, satisfying the victims. 
given that we are living in a patriarchal society in South Sudan, which is mad with cultures. And in our cultures, people don't talk about sexual issues. And the men also, they are brought up in that culture where a woman is supposed to be uh, owned by the man. So you are bringing a case of a woman who is raped, even including when it is raped in the marriage. This judge will not think that it's a crime. He will be thinking first like it's the man's entitlement. And therefore, uh, there's already, I, I could say, even if it's not real uh, biasness, there's already a perceived biasness. And this has shown itself in the way the cases are handled. Um, in case we don't have uh, um, women who can sit in these uh, courts, what we need to do is to have uh, training on gender sensitivity for the judges and also trauma awareness. We had had a situation where one of the victims we brought to court and when the victim saw the perpetrators, she was asked, are these the perpetrators? And this little girl, she was so angry to see these perpetrators. She was almost like yelling in the court and the judge say, please, can you discipline your client? And I'm like, am I supposed to discipline my client or you're supposed to discipline the perpetrators? So these are the challenges that we have in terms of those who are um, uh, executing justice in regards to uh, survivors. And I think most of those who call for survivor approaches, uh, this is what needs to be done so that these judges are also aware of the rights and also the needs of the survivors when they come to the courts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Skaya. Yeah, so I um, worked on the gender responsive policing manual that um, um, one of the other speakers was talking about as well. And I think that, you know, what survivors have told us is that they like to see themselves in the people that, um, you know, are helping them um, so that they appreciate women. We've also learned though, as well from women police officers that the cultures of many criminal justice agencies are very patriarchal themselves and very difficult working conditions. So there are also limitations, right? That women themselves come up against when working in predominantly very patriarchal and really hostile working environments. So a lot of times women wanna push the agencies uh, to work in a particular way, and then they get, you know, they get payback for that, for trying to move institutions forward. So I'd just like to thank the brave women who end up working in criminal justice sort of sectors, because it's, they're really, um, it's not an easy working environment for them to be able to do so. Thank you so much. I wonder if uh, Brigitte or Cecile would like um, a last word. Uh, Brigitte, I see you there. Yes, Th thank you, Jan, and, and thanks to, to really an excellent panel that you managed to get um, on, on the digital floor today. Um, I really uh, learned a lot. Uh, I, I started, I always get a little bit angry when, well, when we have to discuss this subject, but after hearing all the examples, uh, you know, I, I end up even more angry, uh, but also very um, committed to continue working on this extremely important uh, subject with uh, partners on the screen and with you, Jan, and uh, with our embassies in the field. So uh, yeah, let's keep up this good work and exchange uh, all these um, experiences and, and evidence that is being built up on how best to tackle this uh, wicked uh, problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brigitte. Uh, Cecile, are you still there? No, I think she, she may have left. So I would really like to add my, my thanks to all of you, um, all of you joining us online, but particularly to our um, wonderful, oh, there is Cecile. Would you like to say one last word? I'm here in the United Nations uh, conference room now because I'm going to have a nine o'clock uh, session. So okay. I just would like to thank everyone yeah. for right. uh, inviting us. Good. Thanks so much. And thanks to, again, Netherlands and Philippines. Uh, just to, to say, I think we have all, as Brigitte said, learned a lot. And I think that we knew that this is a complex, multi-layered problem, um, as people have talked about intersecting oppressions. And I think that is really the case. Um, but it's very clear that we need you know, multi-sectoral uh, responses and, and clearly multi-stakeholders. I think people have said whole of society. I think that is really true. Clearly crucial to put 
survivors' rights and needs at the center. And I, I liked what was said about the survivors being the agents of change, but also I think we, we've heard we have to find safe spaces uh, for the survivors to be able uh, to do that. I think we've heard very clearly that human rights and legal frameworks are essential, but they're not enough. Um, that really what matters is the implementation. And for implementation, we need uh, resources. Um, nobody really touched on the issue of resources. Um, we all know that they're being diverted in many ways these days, um, away from um, justice sectors, away from basic services. But I think we do uh, really need to keep up the pressure for more resources um, to, be, uh, to be allocated here. I think we heard of the words political will, put your money where your mouth is. And I think that's, uh, this is true, political will is, is, is really important. And this is, for, this is at all levels, including, as we've heard, basic services um, that make um, the law accessible um, to uh, people. And I think with escalating conflicts over the world and of course, increasing effects of climate change, it's just so important that we do address these root causes uh, of violence. And we've heard a lot about linking prevention and response. And I think that's something uh, we all need uh, to think more about. Of course, we've heard um, about um, changing cultural norms, um, clearly important and um, stamping out impunity and the issue of accountability extremely important and here um, we've heard the importance of data I think we we know that and of research and I want to thank those of you who are involved in the research because we're really all learning uh, from that and then I think we've heard a lot too about the importance of female participation at all parts of of the justice chain so um, for us um, at IDLO um, what we have heard and and the, the practical recommendations in particular will be really important as we continue our work um, to, to advance justice for survivors of gender-based violence. And I will particularly remember what Ms. Nasiwa said when she said that survivors feel that justice is peace. I think that's really important. I'd like to thank uh, the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University, UN Women, and the governments of Netherlands and Philippines for your support for this event, but also for your continued partnership. We in IDLO are committed to continue uh, to work with all of you. As I said at the beginning, this is at the core um, of our approach to people-centered justice, women and girls at the center. And we are particularly concerned to have integrated approaches. So to bring together our research, our policy advocacy and our programming on the ground. And there we're looking um, as well as, as looking at uh, gender-based violence, and particularly we're looking at supporting women's participation in the justice sector. We're looking at integrity in the judiciary. We're looking at linking customary and informal justice with formal justice systems. I think all of these areas um, are, are really uh, important as we go forward. And, I was struck yesterday at the opening session of the high level political forum uh, that one of the speakers said that fighting for gender equality is our best strategy for achieving a sustainable future. And I think that we would all agree with that. I want to thank you all, um, everybody uh, who has spoken and everybody online and um, let's continue uh, this work together. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.